Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to everybody. I want to begin this meeting uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to elders from other communities who may also be here today. As I said in my remarks in the annual report, which I'm assuming everyone's read in the few minutes that uh, they've had it, the Institute has entered its second century with gusto. And as you'll well be aware, as you fought your way into the building in this meeting, work has started on our groundbreaking early childhood education and care facility. And this is based on founding donations of a million dollars each from the Dyson bequest and from Sally and Terry Speed. And it's yet another example of the impact of philanthropy that has made this institute what it is today. The annual report uh, details uh, the extraordinary science that's being carried out in this place. And our director, Doug Hilton and others, will elaborate on some of this work later in the meeting. But again, without donor support, these discoveries just simply do not happen. As always, it's also a pleasure to welcome uh, to our AGM, our donors, alumni, bequesters, and our scientists, staff, and students. To all members of the Institute who are here tonight, particularly the newer members who've been able to join us, a very special welcome to you. <coughs> welcome also to all past board members who have joined us and to all our current board and committee members, my special thanks for your contribution in what has been another very active year for the Institute. Financially, times have continued to be challenging for the Australian Medical Research Institute sector. But there is some good news. At the federal level, the proposed Medical Research Future Fund is still on track, according to the budget earlier this week, being projected still to reach its corpus target of $20 billion by 2021. And with the first funding announcements, uh, provided in this week's budget, uh, not in detail, but at least indicating that there will be funding starting to flow very soon. This funding, fortunately, will be in addition to the NH and MRC funding, which is becoming more and more stretched over more institutes and more science around the country. But luckily, I believe the Institute is in a great position with Doug Hilton being on the expert advisory board created to guide the priorities of the fund. And Doug has also been involved in the NH and MRC review, which has been looking at how these funds may be distributed more efficiently uh, into the future. And there is certainly a need for that work. The other positive news is that the Victorian state government's budget last week included an overdue uplift, in our view, of $8 million of indirect cost funding for the sector, the first increase in a decade. We also received a grant of a $1 million to enable further development of our National Drug Discovery Centre initiative, which will allow us to accelerate the translation of research into new drugs in line with global trends in research translation. Walter and Eliza Hall Institute researchers have made discoveries that have helped tens of millions of people recover from cancer and have led to new treatments for cancer now available for patients in Australia and internationally. In fact, more than 100 clinical trials based on the Institute's discoveries are underway as at today. These include trials of vaccines for type 1 diabetes, celiac disease and malaria, and trials of a new class of anti-cancer agents for treating patients with leukaemia. The achievements of the Institute scientists and those who've supported them since we started are the foundations on which this place's reputation has been built and is maintained. Our track record in groundbreaking scientific discoveries that translate into improved treatments for patients is underpinned by a culture and commitment to innovation, 
fuelled by collaboration. We are very conscious not only of our exceptional philanthropic support, but also the collaboration with other organisations which have been involved with us over the past 101 years and continues to underpin our growth and success, in particular, the Walter and Eliza Hall Trust, the University of Melbourne, the Royal Melbourne Hospital and CSL. I want to take a few extra minutes tonight in comparison with uh, previous AGMs to talk a little bit more about the governance of the Institute. As you will see in the annual report, the Institute's mission, vision and values are set out simply and clearly in that annual report. Research discovery remains core to our mission and strengthening our interdisciplinary capabilities will ensure that we can further realise our vision, which is simply to be an innovative research institute which improves health outcomes through discovery, translation and education. As you know, we are Australia's oldest medical research institute and with a deep heritage in responsible and sustainable governance. The board's role is appropriately, is, sorry, to appropriately govern the institute and thus ensure that those who support us receive the outcomes or at least progress is made towards the outcomes that have, been motiv that have motivated their support. Groundbreaking discoveries in medical research require long-term investment and the Institute is ensuring it is a strategic and sustainable operation for generations to come. As your president, it is my belief that we have had and continue to have a board which is exceptional in its commitment to the Institute and in the quality of discussions and decisions and increasingly in its diversity based on many measures. Again, in the annual report, you will notice that we had four board members retire last year. Stephen Scala, Mike Fitzpatrick, Catherine Walter and Gareth Goodyear. And to each of them, my sincere thanks for all that you contributed to the Institute and in so many ways. So given those changes and the number of new board members we now have, I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce all of the board to you and particularly highlight the diversity of their experience and knowledge. So if I could ask the board members to come up on the stage, I'll say a few more words and then just very quickly uh, tell you a little bit about them and I think you'll very, very quickly get a, a sense of just how different their experiences have been. <coughs> My strong and personal belief, I guess, is that boards that are appropriately diverse in their composition will be smarter than the smartest people in them. And given that as a starting point, we must have a pretty good board. Within our 14 board members, of whom the University and Melbourne Health each nominate two, we share many, many years of leadership roles, both in Australia and elsewhere, across the diverse fields of medical science and research, government, a wide range of business and investment, consulting, academia, law, and the not-for-profit sector. Our board members have led diverse organisations, made great discoveries, studied at leaning universities, and contributed to communities. We bring a powerful mix of expertise and wisdom, a diversity of views, and I assure you a willingness to express them, and a deep commitment to the Institute's continued success. So let me tell you a little bit about each of our board members and including the couple who unfortunately weren't able to join us this evening. So uh, I think Rob, you're down at the end there. Rob Wiley uh, has been on the board now for, uh, it's now in his third year. He's our honorary treasurer, chair of the audit and risk committee of, and of the investment committee, a chartered accountant by background and also, many years ago, an auditor of this institute. He's chair of the ASX-listed company MaxiTrans, was formerly national chair of Deloitte Australia, and was a senior executive partner as well in their US practice. 
And as in Rob's case, but in everyone's case, the amount of information I'm leaving out would fill a page. Uh, who's next, please? I can't see from here. Graham? Well, Graham is part of the furniture almost at WeHi, as many of you would know. Um, he's been on the board for about a decade. He's chair of our commercialisation committee, a veterinarian from his first degree who then moved from Sydney to Melbourne and did his PhD in immunology at WeHi in the late 60s, then headed off overseas for a little while and then came back and established a new program on the immunology of parasitism at the Institute, was subsequently director of research at CSL, was also the director of the Royal Melbourne Zoological Gardens and is now an advisor to the Victorian Government on Science and Innovation. I think John Dyson is next. John is a relatively new board member but chairs our advocacy and support committee, has a science degree and is a former investment banker stockbroker who's been active in venture capital for two decades and is a co-founder of Starfish Ventures. John is a director of several technology companies and uh, as co-trustee of the Dyson Bequest, a centenary fellowship donor to the Institute. Terry Moran has been on our board for around four years and is an arts graduate whose career uh, included being the secretary of the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet, as well as the Federal Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. He's an advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, chair of the Melbourne Theatre Company and of the Barangaroo Delivery Authority in Sydney. Malcolm Broomhead has been on the board for about three years, a civil engineer with an MBA who was formerly chief executive of North Broken Hill and of Orica. Malcolm is now a non-executive director of BHP Billiton and back at Orica as chair. He's also a personal centenary fellowship donor to the Institute. Christine Kilpatrick is our newest uh, director, um, having been in her current role uh, at Melbourne Health for 10 days. So we're <laughs> delighted she could join us. But Christine is uh, the Melbourne Health in, uh, one of the Melbourne Health appointees, a neurologist, specialising in epilepsy, who also has an MBA, was Melbourne Health's Executive Director of Medical Services before she became Chief Executive of the Royal Children's Hospital from 2008 until the end of April. And we're delighted to have her uh, join us as Chief Executive now of Melbourne Health. Jane Hemstrich has been on our board uh, for four years and uh, since last July has been Vice President of the Institute. Jane's got a, another pretty straightforward career. She was, has a science degree in biochemistry and physiology, but has professional expertise in technology, communications, change management and accounting, having been, amongst other things, the managing director of Asia Pacific of Accenture. She's a non-executive on several major listed company boards, including Telstra and Lead Lease, and is also a personal centenary fellowship donor to the Institute. Next, Professor Ingrid Winship has been on the board for 10 years. Uh, is also a Melbourne Health, Royal Melbourne appointee, a medical graduate from Cape Town, majoring in genetics and dermatology, the inaugural chair of adult clinical genetics at the University of Melbourne and executive director of research for Melbourne Health. Rufus Black. I didn't ask everyone to stand in the right order, obviously, so that's uh, why I'm fiddling around a little bit. Uh, Associate Professor Rufus Black has been on our board for four years and is also, very importantly, chairman of our Human Research Ethics Committee. Rufus has, is Master of Ormond College, and I've described him here, and he may or may not agree with some of these descriptions, but a lawyer, philosopher and theologian who also happened to be a Rhodes Scholar and is a former partner of McKinsey & Company. 
another pretty straightforward career. <laughs> He's president of Museum Victoria and through Ormond College, College's Thwaites Gutch Endowment, a centenary fellowship donor to the Institute. <laughs> Professor Jim McCluskey uh, has been on our board for six years and is a University of Melbourne appointee. He's Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and a Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor in Microbiology and Immunology. And I read, has published more than 300 uh, academic papers, so I don't know what he does in his spare time. <laughs> He's also, importantly, from our perspective, Chair of the Nossel Institute and uh, through the university, uh, a Centenary Fellowship donor uh, to the Matheson Centenary Fellowships. And last but not least in this, this group on stage is Professor Shatish Kapoor, who is also a University of Melbourne appointee. He is Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, and Assistant Vice-Chancellor Health at the University. Shatish is a clinician scientist with expertise in psychiatry, neuroscience and brain imaging, and a graduate from the universities of Pittsburgh and Toronto. Before coming to Melbourne, he was Executive Dean of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, Europe's largest and leading centre for mental health research. Now that's the group on stage and as I mentioned there are a couple of people who could not be here and I'll just briefly introduce them to you in, in absence. Mari MacDonald joined our board last year. She is a, has a science degree majoring in chemistry but then became a lawyer and was formerly a partner of Blake Dawson, or now known as Ashurst, specialising in corporate and commercial law. And she is a non-executive director of CSL. And last but not least, Carolyn Viney, who also joined the board last year. Carolyn is a lawyer uh, by education. She worked with Minter Ellison. She's currently general manager development at Vicinity Centres, the shopping centre manager and spent 13 years with Grocon, the major development and construction company, initially as their in-house lawyer, but for the last three years as their chief executive. So, um, I invite you now to go back to your seats. Thank you. But I, I hope I've at least been able to give you a sense that we have interesting board meetings. Uh, we have an extraordinary mixture of experience and knowledge and uh, it's, it's a delight to be part of it. Now, let me conclude. And I would ask you to join me in congratulating our director, Doug Hilton, who continues to need, lead not only this institute, but whose impact on the sector through his now past chairmanship of the Australian Association of Medical Research Institutes has been extremely significant. So thank you for listening and I'll now hand over to our treasurer, Rob Wiley. Okay, well after all of that excitement, uh, there is more to come. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to ask you to receive and consider the statement of financial position, the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, the statement of cash flows and the reports of the directors and of the auditor in respect of the 12 months ending 31 December 2016. The net surplus for the year was 9,086,000 which exceeded the full year surplus to December 2015 of 1,250,000. The Institute's total revenue for the year was a record 130 million, which included 113.9 million of operating revenue for research and a very pleasing 6.9 million of grants and donations for scientific equipment and capital works. 
The 10.2 million increase in the Institute's operating revenue in 2016 largely represents the growth in net royalty income to 9.2 million. The major component of this important income stream is the milestone payment arising from the approval by the United States Food and Drug Administration in April 2016 of the use of the Venetoclax anti-cancer drug in the US. We're very conscious of the need to preserve our investment capital base, particularly at a time of continued economic uncertainty and low yields. We are long-term investors. We do not trade in the short term. The value of the securities in our investment portfolio was 221.7 million at the 31st of December 2016, which represents an increase of 12 million over the year. Whilst the portfolio was adversely impacted in the latter months of 2015, it did recover during 2016. And this reduced the charge against the Institute's operating results for the impairment of investments to 539,000 compared to 4.8 million in the prior year. Overall, this is a very pleasing outcome. And once again, I'd like to thank those members of the financial community who do graciously give up their time to serve on the investment committee. I'd also like to acknowledge J.B. Weir, <laughs> who have worked tirelessly on behalf of the Institute during the year. Also, infrastructure, is, infrastructure funding is critical, and we are pleased to acknowledge the continuing support of both the Victorian and federal governments. Also, as chairman of the Audit and Risk Committee, I would like to express my appreciation to my colleagues who serve on this important committee which advises the board on its financial stewardship of the organization and who provide valuable oversight on the preparation of this annual financial report. The external audit performed by Deloitte Tushtamatsu progressed smoothly and there are no matters of major concern. The Deloitte partners, Tom Mbezi and Annika Dutois are here today and can answer any questions members may have on the audit. And so, members of the Institute, I now move that the Statement of Financial Position, the Statement of Profit and Loss and Other Comprehensive Income, the Statement of Cash Flows and the Reports of the Directors and of the Auditor for the financial period ended 31 December 2016 be received. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Malcolm. Are there any questions? I will now put the motion. All members in favor, please raise your hand. Against? Carried unanimously. unanimously. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, everybody. I wanted to add to Chris's welcome to country. Um, and especially at a time in which, as a nation, we're discussing things like immigration and 457 working visas, I wanted to pay my respects to all of those people um, that have come to these shores, whether for refuge or opportunity, especially our staff members, and to pay my respects to their descendants, as well as the traditional owners of the land on which we're based, on which we have this wonderful gathering to discuss uh, achievements and the support that we received from the community in 2016. I think having such a wonderfully multicultural, diverse institute is part of the recipe for not just the success of biomedical research on this precinct, but I think for creating a wonderful city like Melbourne. And I think that diversity really is one of the reasons why medical research in 2016 is moving apace. Cell by cell, we're painting a beautiful picture of how we develop from a single fertilised egg to create organisms of remarkable complexity. We're also beginning to understand cell by cell how 
the 30 trillion cells in our body can be turned over to the point where we generate 250 billion new cells every day. And for the vast majority of us, for the vast majority of time, that goes without a hiccup. Letter by letter, we're deciphering the genome, developing an understanding of what makes us human, what we have in common, and also what distinguishes us as individuals. And atom by atom, we're creating remarkably accurate 3D sculptures of molecular machines that underpin life. And over the last century, the last decade, and as you will see from the annual report, the 2016 annual report, over the last year, the Institute's researchers, in collaboration with researchers around the precinct, and Chris mentioned a couple of our key collaborative organisations, the University of Melbourne and Melbourne Health, but the number is much wider than that. Together with our professional service teams that underpin the life of the Institute, it's been really pleasing to see that we've been part of pushing the frontiers of knowledge. And I'd like to highlight four areas in particular that I think encapsulate the breadth of our con contribution. The first is a series of studies that really follow on from the remarkable studies that have led to the development of venetoclax. Venetoclax targets one of the five family members of cell survival genes called the BCL2 family, MCL1, is another one of those families. And through the work of Andreas Strasser, Marco Herald, Gemma Kelly, Andrew Roberts, David Wang, Guillaume Lustine, Suzanne Corey, Jerry Adams, and a whole host of laboratories, their staff and students, what we've been able to begin to understand is the role that MCL1 plays in the survival of cancer cells, and in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company, Servia, begin to probe what it means to be able to inhibit that cell survival protein, MCL1, and explore the potential of those drugs as potential new cancer therapies. That's going to be a story that I hope I will update you on for a number of years to come. The second area I wanted to highlight is one that probably doesn't get highlighted too much in annual reports, and that is really our contribution to handling and understanding the vast amounts of data that have been generated as part of the genome revolution. I want to highlight a package of software called Bioconductor that's really been spearheaded at WEHI by Gordon Smythe, Terry Speed, Matt Ritchie, Melanie Barlow, Melissa Davis, Wei Shi, and a whole host of their postdoc students and staff members. One of the hallmarks of good bioinformatics is not just that the papers that those um, new methods for handling data are published in are cited widely by the academic world, but those programs are accessed and downloaded. And there have been 27,000 downloads a month from the different modules that are part of the Bioconductor package. And I think, again, that the bioinformatics team, uh, bioinformatics teams at WEHI play a central role in our ability to do great 21st century science. I want to highlight also our immunologists. One of the programs that I found particularly intriguing has been the work of Phil Hodgkin, Sue Heinzel, Julia Marchingo, and a whole lot of collaborators that they have, understanding how lymphoid cells make decisions about which direction to differentiate into, understanding the laws that govern the survival and the production of those cells. They've had a whole series of papers in beautiful journals over the last few years. And I think when combined with the remarkable investment and changes in technology that are occurring in cell imaging, that these areas will come together and there'll be, I think, some remarkable breakthroughs made in the years to come. And again, it's an area that I'm looking forward to reporting on in the future. And the final area that, that you will hear about a little later is with our infectious diseases crew and there's a whole team, including Wei Hong, Evo Mueller, Melanie Barlow, again from Population Health and Immunity, Alyssa Barry, and all of their teams and collaborators that are beginning to understand how the cell surface of the malaria parasite manipulates the red blood cell to allow it to invade. And Wei Hong's going to talk to you a little later about that. These four vignettes capture our commitment, not just to basic science, something that we hold as really important, but also our resolve to translate our discoveries into improvements in disease prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. 
That's what the community expects us to do. And delivering on this expe expectation is part of the reason there's such a widespread community support and political support for health and medical research. I think it's important as an institute that we ask what more the community expects. And as Chris Thomas, our board president, outlined, one of the community one of the things that the community rightly insists on is that the money that it invests in medical research, whether through NHMRC, the MRFF, the state government or donations and bequests, is spent appropriately and invested prudently. And this is an expectation that the board takes very seriously. And as a director of the institute, um, that is a tough board. As there's students in the, organ in, in the audience and postdocs it's like going to the toughest lab meeting five times a year, presenting, being grilled, not having assumptions that you put forward accepted without challenge. Um, it really is, for me, everything that the Institute encompasses all the way down through our Institute seminars, through our division seminars, and through the conversations that we have pouring over primary data, arguing, challenging, probing. I think it's part of the culture and the fabric of this organisation and it's something that I wouldn't want any other way. The community also expects that our research is carried out with the utmost integrity and that we engage them in conversations around the ethical limits to which our research is pushed. And we're also serious about this expectation. In the area of scientific integrity, we have a passionate internationally regarded voice for this cause and that's as all of the scientists here will know, one of our deputy directors, Professor David Vo. And I'm also really delighted that we have a treasured alumnus who's returning to the campus, Dr Glenn Begley. For a decade, Glenn was vice president and global head of haematology and oncology research at Amgen, and has really over the last few years become a champion of good scientific practice in the US in an attempt to get improved re re reproducibility in science. And I'm sure Glenn will begin to play a renewed role in the life of this institute. We have a remarkable animal ethics committee that for a decade has been chaired by Professor Colin Chapman and a human ethics committee chaired for about the same length of time by Professor Rufus Black. What's good about both of these committees is they're not simply legislatively compliant committees that rubber stamp our research. I've attempted, uh, attended both of those committees off and on and I can tell you they're composed of thoughtful, engaged, committed members who subject us to scrutiny and hold us to account, and for that I'm deeply grateful to all of you. We also have less formal but equally important mechanisms for engaging the community in discussion about the direction and appropriate limits of our research, and I'm particularly grateful to Judith Slocum and the amazing members of the community who make up our consumer advisory group who facilitate some of these discussions. They're important for us. The combination of our Animal Ethics Committee, our Human Research Ethics Committee and our Consumer Advisory Program, plus the high level engagement with the community that we have at events like this, I think place us on a firm footing. Also, however, I would also like to add that as with our research and our translation and our governance and our professional services, we're not feeling smug and we're always looking for ways to improve. One of the ways that we've engaged with the community over the last 20 years is via animations, scientifically accurate and visually beautiful. And I know, forget the chairman's address, forget the director's address, the one thing that this audience looks forward to every year is the presentations by either Drew Berry or one of his teams of the animations that have become such a highlight of our AGM. Yes. And so in order not to disappoint you for any longer, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Drew. Drew. Wonderful. Actually, this year versus previous years, I'm actually going to do something slightly different. We're not going to, I'm not going to play our current productions, we have quite a few really exciting things underway at the moment, particularly high-end technology. This year I'm going to do a little bit of a retrospective and um, really I'm, what I'm highlighting is a, it was enabled by a generous grant of support from the Telematics Trust, which allowed us to reorganize and open up our 20-year back catalog of biomedical animations and other education resources and provide easy access for teachers, students, and scientists around the world. 
Since its inception in 1990, WeHi TV has collaborated with many global uh, education projects with goals of providing the highest quality free science education to reach huge audiences and leverage the efforts of universities, museums, and other science organizations around the world. However, a consequence of our collaborating is that our animations end up in project outcomes that um, the majority of the animations become orphaned or trapped within products that have a lifespan and then come to the end of that. Um, so, for example, textbooks or a museum exhibition or many other sorts of things. The format has expired or the product has expired. So with funding support from the Telematics Trust last year, we're able to revisit our older app productions and prepare them for an online social network audience. At the beginning of tw uh, 2016, the Institute had published 23 biomedical animations to date uh, on YouTube and on our, on our website. With the successful completion of the Telematics Trust project, our current total is more than 60 animations, with at least another dozen in the pipeline soon to be published. I have chosen four brief examples from our back catalog of 20 years uh, to highlight uh, our newly revived older material. The first one, um, in 1999, I had the great pleasure to spend an afternoon to peering over the shoulder of the great Don Metcalf with multiple cameras capturing his knowledge, wit, and experience in identifying the different types of cells in mouse blood. The original video we distributed on, in DVD around the year 2000 by postal mail to people around the world. The film Atlas of Mouse Blood runs for 22 minutes. And so I've selected 60 seconds just to give you a little taste of uh, Don's point of view about the different types of, of mouse blood. So here we are, lovely monocyte. It'd kill to have a monocyte like that. <laughs> What's different? What's different? Nucleus is not round shaped, it's bean shaped or U shaped. Cytoplasm is not so small that you can hardly see it, you can see it around there. It's a bluish colour and it's faintly granular or usually described as being like a piece of ground glass. So in a mouse spleen there will be one or two percent of a number of types. This is a very nice eosinophil where you can clearly see the orange granules in the cytoplasm and the ring-shaped nucleus. And this large cell here is a macrophage. It's what a monocyte in the blood has become when it sits in the tissues. So you can see there are two lymphocytes, an eosinophil and a macrophage. Now we go to the hard one. Bone marrow. This is the one that people really don't like to work with. Now they reach for the fax machine to tell them everything. What's the problem? There are seven different cell populations in the bone marrow. Fax can't tell you that for a start. Uh, it's fabulous. What a fabulous way to learn about all the different cell types. Uh, next up are just three very short animations um, that were from a project which we launched in 2014, a free interactive textbook of biology that we uh, developed with E.O. Wilson at Harvard. Um, the animations have now been re reformatted for an online audience, such as this GIF, which I'll oops, play now, uh, which is perfect for sharing via social media, email, Facebook, and tweets. The purpose of this GIF is to convey the size of a cell and relate it to our normal human perception of scale. The animation runs in a continuous loop, so it can be contemplated and enjoyed as long as desired before being forwarded onto friends and family. <laughs> so it's really not supposed to be at this large scale on a screen. It's really meant to be on a mobile phone, but it gives you a sense of uh, what this kind of thing can be like. And, and these sorts of uh, materials, we haven't produced them up until now, but we're about to release, I think, at least a dozen of these sorts of GIFs. Next up, also from the uh, E.O. Wilson Life on Earth textbook, um, there were a collection within that uh, of 10 animations which I explored uh, the major structures found in a living cell. These brief animations are designed to set the scene and location for where key cell cellular activities occur. 
First up is the tiny and very dynamic organelle, the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is a stack of flattened membrane discs that process newly made proteins and lipids from the endoplasmic reticulum. During their journey through the Golgi, proteins are modified and packaged and then directed to their final destination within the cell or to the plasma membrane for secretion. So the particular relevance of this particular uh, organelle to the work that goes on at uh, WEHI is particularly the, the diabetes research. So this is uh, the structure that uh, is involved with the manufacture and processing of insulin. So th this particular uh, model of, of the Golgi was developed from uh, a combination of uh, time-lapse microscopy of the organelle because it's very dynamic, you have to watch it in action, but also because it's so small, it was uh, developed from data from uh, uh, electron tomography, so uh, from a, a pancreatic beta cell, where they uh, were able to take out a cell and through very fine slices, slice by slice by slice, uh, reconstruct the 3D shape of, of the Golgi. So uh, insulin would be, uh, the pro-insulin, a precursor to insulin would be developed on the left-hand side, the nucleus on the left-hand side, then through the endoplasmic reticulum, then it be, it's processed through the Golgi, and then these large vesicles uh, at the end here would contain insulin granules, large uh, insulin granules, that when the beta cell receives the right stimulus from the rest of the, uh, of the, the body, it will then uh, secrete or dump those insulin granules into the bloodstream as required. And one final animation uh, is my uh, personal favorite organelle, the mitochondria. Um, and I'll go ahead and play and then we'll discuss it after. The major function of the mitochondria is to provide the cell with energy in the form of the energy-rich molecule ATP. Mitochondria are dynamic and come in a variety of shapes and sizes, fusing and dividing to suit the changing needs of the cell. So among its many important roles inside the cell, the mitochondria is a location where the proteins BCL2, BAC, and BACs perform their roles with apoptosis. So a final thank you to the Telematics Trust in supporting our activities and enabling this to happen and helping us organize and, in, and build the data infrastructure that we require for future growth. So thank you. I'm like someone who could be an animator in Pixar, but also has the voice of David Attenborough, so <laughs> well done, Drew. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wei Hong Tam, who will give the scientific pres uh, presentation at our AGM. Wei Hong is a laboratory head in the Infection and Immunity Division. Um, she is, although she is very small, she makes that up with feistiness. And really one of my first interactions with Wei Hong was at the end of a postdoctoral dinner where I'd been talking about some of the plans that we had around gender equity and supporting women that have children. And I don't think there was any red wine previously involved, but she put her hand up and she said, sweetheart, you have no idea what it's like to raise children. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to introduce one of my favorite lab heads, Wei Hong Tam. Okay, all right, today we're going to talk about malaria. And so malaria remains one of um, the world's deadliest disease. And while you can be so partly inundated with around the statistics around malaria, the one that really resonates with me is that just a couple of years ago, every 30 seconds, a child dies from malaria. And this is normally, a, very likely, a child under the age of five. To survive within our bodies, the malaria parasites have to invade your blood. And this is the major research team that I'm interested in, is how the malaria parasite actually enters your blood. This is one of my favorite photos, whereby you are surrounded by healthy red blood cells, and then you have a couple of these infected red blood cells. And what you see here is the malaria parasite peeking out from a red blood cell that it's eaten up all the contents, the hemoglobin, to feed itself, and now it's done with that red blood cell and it's going to release their new parasites and progeny to infect the rest of your blood in your bloodstream. Drew Barry's animation, an oldie but a goodie, a malaria parasite in yellow, 
kind of burrowing into your blood. It cushions, finds your blood and um, has an active cushioning. The dandruff that's coming off is actually the parasite surface coat just getting shed as it penetrates into your blood. Within 48 hours, this parasite is actually going to renovate your blood to create a home to grow and reproduce from one parasite to about 30 new parasites that will then come out and infect more of your blood. So here again, I'm glad Drew didn't show any of this, but these remain some of the really nicest kind of fine scale illustrations that Drew has done of the malaria parasite. It's tiny, it's only one micron in diameter. And what Drew has done here is shown the surface coat in gray and also the top of that surface coat, of that surface coat to kind of give a really beautiful in-depth view of what this parasite looks like. And it's incredible, it's got a nucleus, but it's also got these specialized organelles that make it this exquisite invasion machine. And things like this, cup-shaped organelles here called the rub trees or the micronemes at the apical tip, they contain fats and proteins that help the parasite um, enter your blood by injecting these proteins on the surface of the red blood cell or injecting an environment that now um, can actually allow parasite growth. So here is another image of what a malaria parasite might look like. It's a scanning EM image from the 1970s of a zoonotic parasite called Plasmodium nosei. And this image is about 50,000 fold magnified. And so in the circle here is actually the parasite. And this is actually the surface of the red blood cell. So when we talk about parasite and human host, and the part of the biology that I'm interested in is exactly when the parasite contacts the red blood cell. It's at this apical tip where we saw all those specialized organelles. They're going to put parasite proteins at this apical tip. And those parasite proteins will find a red blood cell protein, form a lock and key interaction that says to this parasite, I'm a blood cell, the parasite recognizes it, it's going to commit to invasion, and then it will have active penetration into the blood. And this is the part that I'm really, really interested in. If you take a cartoon form, in terms of what scientists like to think about, you know, how many of these lock and key interactions we have, this is from a very recent review. We talk about Plasmodium falciparum, which is the most lethal and the most deadly of human um, malaria parasites. You can see that there's quite a few um, parasite proteins that are known. And underneath, they have actually um, described um, red blood cell proteins that it recognizes. And so these are these lock and key interactions that we're talking about. More recently, when I started my lab, I decided to tackle Plasmodium vivax. Plasmodium vivax has really interesting biology. It's the most widely distributed um, human malaria parasite, and it also relapses. But what you see is that underneath here, there's not very much known about how this parasite interacts with the blood. And this is one of those major questions that I try to tackle um, in our lab. So when I talk about the biological interface between human hosts, in terms of my biology, this is what I'm talking about. Um, lock and key interactions um, that actually we can try to understand um, what's happening. And if you understand these interactions well enough, you can develop inhibitors or antibodies that can block invasion. To do that, we use um, X-ray clusterography to really get down, really drill down to what these atomic resolution interactions are going to be. And these are crystals um, of a parasite protein that we then diffracted at the Australian synchrotron. And what that allows you to do is actually solve the crystal structure. It gives you a three-dimensional map of what this parasite protein looks like. And this is a parasite protein that binds red blood cells. And what you see here is a bundle of ribbons. But the formation and the collection of these bundle of ribbons actually gives the three-dimensional shape of these proteins. And, and more importantly, what it does allow you to do is build a map of where these different atoms are. And so this is just a very small area of part of this protein. But what you can see here is basically the density and the spatial resolution of where these atoms are. And so if you can get the parasite uh, ligand interacting with the red blood cell receptor, you really have a map for designing an inhibitor or an antibody. 
as we start to collect these crystal structures of what these proteins look like, we observe that they form a very similar fold. This is sort of three proteins, um, two overlaid upon one, but both from Plasmodium falciparum and also from Plasmodium vivax. Similar structural scaffold, but really they're binding very different receptors on the red blood cells. So one of the big mysteries that we try to understand is how can you have a structural framework that looks so similar, but what are the properties that are going to differ within these proteins, and how do those properties then allow them to interact with your blood? And one of those clues is the surface charge, and so if you then now don't look at it as a ribbon form, but you actually look at what these amino acids um, give you in terms of presenting on the surface. So for instance, this protein has a negative charge on this side, where if you actually change this negative charge, this loses the ability of this protein to bind blood, whilst the, this has a positive charge um, surface. And then if you're really lucky enough, not only do you have a crystal structure of your, of your parasite binding protein shown in gold, you then have the red blood cell receptor coming up in blue. And here now then you can really understand where on the, red blood, uh, on the parasite protein is the receptor binding to. And this is going to be the surface that you're going to target in order to prevent that. So what I'm going to do is show you a couple movies, and these are not animated movies. These are true live image uh, uh, movies of malaria parasites actually invading uh, human red blood cells. Um, but before I play the movie, it's going to be quite quick. I'm going to point out that the, here is an infected red blood cell. It's chock full of malaria parasites. They are done with the eating your hemoglobin in the blood, and they're going to rupture out, and they're going to release these new parasites into your bloodstream. And what you're going to see is I want you to see how they interact with these neighboring healthy red blood cells. And what I do want you to pay attention to is that when the parasite actually contacts the red blood cell, you're going to see a cushioning effect. And this is the interaction that we're talking about between parasite and human host. Okay, out they come. Okay, do you see that cushioning? And in, the parasite goes in, okay? And then here, there's another one cushioning here, and then the parasite goes in. And so this is a very dynamic process upon rupture, and then if you look at the counter here, within a minute and a half, you're actually going to see successful invasion. And here, as you can see here, the red blood cells actually starts to change shape because there's been a very dynamic change in ionic conditions, and this phenomenon is called echinocytosis. It's a classic thing that we see in blood when malaria parasites have actually entered and successfully entered your blood. This will resolve within 10 minutes. Now, if you understand enough some of these interactions, you can develop an inhibitor or an antibody. And what I have here in this movie is basically these parasites growing in media that has an inhibitor in it. So once again, we're going to focus on the red blood cell here that's chock full of parasites, and those parasites are going to come out. And then, you, you know, I hope you get to see um, something different in this movie. All right, parasites are out, no problem getting out. The inhibitor isn't stopping them from getting out, but they glide along. They seem to be able to contact red blood cells, but there's none of this very dynamic cushioning that's happening. And in fact, these parasites can have physical contact um, with the red blood cell, but that what that inhibitor has done is actually prevent the parasite from seeing your blood. And so while it can contact it, there's actually no active penetration of the blood, and they just sort of sit there, and after a while, they become actually non-viable. And this is really, this movie encapsulates really why, what I work on and the things that we try to work on, which is to really understand on atomic resolution how these interactions are occurring so that we can actually develop an inhibitor that would stop the parasite from entering your blood. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to just... Wei Hong's presentation there by saying um, Wei Hong in the last few years has um, really started her lab and one of the big elements to the success of her group getting through those first few years has been the support that she's received from donors and supporters at the Institute, um, particularly the recipient last year of, uh, I think in 2015, of the Speedy Grant, which was a generous innovation of Pauline Speedy.
um, who passed away last year, very sadly. Um, we're continuing those speedy grants as, as I think, a wonderful legacy. Um, but that not only enabled um, Wei Hong to do the wonderful science, but also now to be recognised internationally as one of the new Howard Hughes Fellows. Um, I think there have been, I think you were saying, Jim, five out of the six fellowships that were awarded to Australians were from four researchers on this campus, two at the Institute and three at the University. I think that is a fantastic outcome, especially when one considers that was five out of 21, um, 21 fellowships awarded worldwide. 41, still very good. Five out of 41 <laughs> worldwide. 21, um, new. 21 new. So look, that, that really is, I think, um, a testament to the fact that we have donors and supporters that trust the judgments of the senior scientists when they're appointing amazing young researchers like Wei Hong and a whole host of others that I could have asked to give this sort of talk. It's something that we're deeply thankful for and I think it's something that really provides a launching pad to um, remarkable careers and remarkable contributions for years to come. So thank you all. I want to go to a special part of the annual general meeting and that is where we give two types of awards. One of them is uh, a, a set of scholarships that recognise the 60 year contribution that Professor Don Metcalf has made to the Institute. On Don's passing uh, in 2014, we launched the Metcalf Scholarships, which are to support the participation for the first time of young researchers who are doing their undergraduate degrees, primarily at the University of Melbourne, to come and work at the Institute and gain that first exposure to research. That for Don, as an undergraduate medical student, was the thing that launched his career at the University of Sydney so many years ago. The Metcalf scholarships, as I said, were established by remarkable donations from a whole host of donors and alumni and, and people who knew, would, knew Don and were touched by his discoveries. To date, we've given seven of these awards, but thanks to the generous support from many donors and the donations, I have to say, keep coming in to support these scholarships. This year, I'm very pleased that we were able to award six new Metcalf scholarships and I'd like to welcome the successful uh, recipients of those awards to the Institute. Um, I'll ask you to come up one by one, and somebody's going to help me with the awards. Um, the first one is William Chiang. William's research project will be supervised by Anna Voss and Tim Thomas within the Development and Cancer Division, and William's project will examine how the body regulates a number of early immune pre-B cells. William, congratulations. <laughs> The second recipient is Somia Mera. Somia's research project will be with Alyssa Barry in Population Health and Immunity Division, studying the spread and diversity of malaria parasite populations. Well done, Somia. Thank you. Our third recipient is Hui Min Tay. She will work with Dr. Ethan goddard Borger in our ACRF Chemical Biology Division on a medicinal chemistry project with potential applications for preventing or treating urinary tract infections. Congratulations, we. Our fourth Metcalf Award recipient is Richard Yan. Richard will be supervised by Dr. Lee Coulthus in Development and Cancer Division, investigating the interplay between cell death and blood vessel formation. Well done, Richard. Our fifth Metcalf Award recipient is Natalie Yu. Natalie will work with Dr. Daniel Gray in the Molecular Genetics of Cancer and Immunology Divisions, investing, investigating how immune T cells make the decisions whether or not to launch immune responses. Well done, Natalie. <laughs> uh, 
And our final award recipient is Stephen Zhang. Stephen will be supervised by Dr. Charlene Naik in the Molecular Medicine Division, and he will use novel techniques to individually track developing blood and immune cells. Fantastic work, Stephen. I'm getting out of order here, and I'm surrounded. Congratulations, everybody. This is part of uh, really the start of a program where the Institute is looking over the next few years to determine how it can better reach uh, a larger number of outstanding recruits, whether at an undergraduate level, honours level, PhDs, postdocs, lab heads or division heads. If we want to become, take ourselves globally to the next level of health and medical research, we need to be tapping into talent worldwide. And this is really part of that process. How can we do better at identifying, attracting and developing remarkable talent? Um, all of those award recipients were, were provided their prizes based on their academic performance. Um, and we think are going to do great things in the laboratory for years to come. One of the lovely things that I've seen over the last 20 years, we've had an undergraduate opportunity program, um, undergraduate research opportunity program at this institute is some of our early undergraduates who've worked in the Institute have become lab heads here and lab heads elsewhere and are doing amazing things. So I think as a senior scientist, that's one of the most enjoyable things to see is the development of young researchers. Mm -hmm. And I know that all six of our Metcalf scholars will go on to do great things. So congratulations, all of you. <laughs> one of the things we've noticed over the last few years is that we recognise our undergraduates, we recognise our honours students, we recognise uh, laboratory heads and, and postdocs in terms of the Bennett Prize, but we've been absent in the way we recognise our PhD students. And our PhD students are really the engine houses in many ways of some of the most important discoveries that the Institute's made over the last 30 years. We wanted to name this award after um, somebody who had done their PhD at the Institute and had been not only a good mentor, um, but gone on to do great science. Um, we could think of no better person to honour in this way than Lynn Corcoran. So I'd like to announce the creation of the Corcoran Award. Lynn is uh, somebody who is thinking about retiring from active bench work in the next year or so. Um, but has made a stunning contribution to the Institute, both in terms of her science, her mentorship, her advocacy for gender equity, um, and in so many other ways. So I'd like to congratulate Lynn, uh, acknowledge her contribution, and launch the Corcoran Awards. <laughs> so the, we have two inaugural Corcoran Award winners. Um, and it's students that have completed their PhDs and have contributed to uh, the scientific world by publishing outstanding papers. Uh, and this was, this was an award that is judged by our education committee with recommendations made to me. And I'd like to congratulate uh, two people, Dr James Ricard and Dr Catherine Potts. James was a PhD student with John Silk and David Vo. James's research focused on the molecular intersections between inflammation and cell death, including a newly recognised form of cell death called necroptosis. That's a word you're going to hear a lot more about in the next few years. His research defined the role of cell death in inflammatory skin diseases such as psoriasis, as well as systematic inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease. James's research has contributed to an impressive 13 research publications to date, including a first author paper in the leading international journal, Cell. And following his studies here, James commenced medical training at Monash University. And I think he's someone who is going to combine research and clinical care and do amazing things in the future. Congratulations, James. Kathy Potts' studies were supervised by Samir Taudi and me, investigated the earliest stages of blood formation in the embryo, specifically looking at the formation of platelets, 
and these are the tiny cells that allow our blood to clot. Her studies revealed a previously unrecognised pathway of platelet formation, resulted in two first author publications in the leading haematology journal, Blood, and she was awarded, I think, the presentation prize for the best student seminar last year. She gave a stunning seminar. Cathy's unable to join us tonight because she's recently commenced her postdoctoral training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Um, is there, did we have anybody to receive her prize? No, we're going to post it to New York. So that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I'd like to hand over to Chris. Do you want to conclude or would you like me to conclude, Chris? Okay, I'd like to hand over to Chris Thomas, who's going to say a few concluding remarks. Chris. Thank you, Doug. And as I suggested at the uh, start of the meeting, it's been a pretty good year for science at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. So to Doug and his team of leading scientists, but to all the, the staff and students, uh, can I ask you just to join me and thank them and congratulate them on their achievements. Well, we've had yet another controversial annual meeting. No questions again. <laughs> it's... Uh, you wonder if the preparation's worth it almost, but, uh, <laughs> but no, uh, thank you very much, all of you who, who've joined us this evening. Um, just a couple of announcements to conclude, and uh, they are firstly that guests attending the Institute members' dinner uh, need to depart uh, at around 6.30 for Ormond College, and there'll be people outside uh, making sure that occurs. There's a convoy of buses heading over Royal Parade, uh, so uh, we look forward to you joining us there. Secondly, uh, the award winners, if you could please uh, remain in the auditorium um, and there'll be some photographs taken uh, for each of you. And last but not least, uh, I'd invite everyone to move into the tapestry lounge uh, just outside for light refreshments and thank you again for attending.